our traditional introduction. When the great Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov saw misfortune threatening the world, it was his custom to go into a certain part of the forest to meditate. There he would light a fire, say a special prayer, and the miracle would be accomplished and the misfortune averted. Later, when his disciple celebrated Maggid of Mizrich had occasion for the same reason, to intercede with heaven, he would go to the same place in the forest and say, master of the universe, listen, I do not know how to light the fire, but I am still able to say the prayer. And again, the miracle would be accomplished. Still later, Rabbi Moshe Leib of Sasav, in order to save his people once more, would go into the forest and say, I do not know how to light the fire. I do not know the prayer, but I know the place and this must be sufficient. It was sufficient and the miracle was accomplished. Then it fell to Rabbi Israel of Rijin to overcome misfortune. Sitting in his armchair, his head in his hands, he spoke to God. I'm unable to light the fire and I do not know the prayer. I cannot even find a place in the forest. All I can do is to tell the story and this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient. Well, I'm going to now uh, <coughs> share the screen. And uh, we had a couple of weeks ago in honor of the, uh, the second half of the Omer, a time when weddings used to begin traditionally in the Jewish community. We started with a wedding story. And here's another wedding story. And it's called A Wedding in Brownsville or Bronzeville. Um, and uh, it's from the very noted uh, author, Isaac Bashevis Singer. So I'm going to make it a little bigger. There you go. And here we go starting with right here. And uh, I'm inviting somebody to do the reading. Going once, going twice. All right, John, you got it. The wedding had been a burden to Dr. Solomon Margolin from the very beginning. True, it was to take place on a Sunday, but Gretel had been right when she had said that that was the only evening in the week they could spend together. It always turned out that way. His responsibilities to the community made him give away the evenings that belonged to her. The Zionists had appointed him to a committee. He was a board member of a Jewish scholastic society. He had become a co-editor of an academic Jewish quarterly. And though he often referred to himself as an agnostic and even an atheist, nevertheless, for years, he had been dragging Gretel to seders at Abraham Mechlis. Mechlis? Mechelis, a landsman <clears throat> from Sensimen. Dr. Margolin treated rabbis, refugees, and Jewish writers without charge, supplying them with medicines and, if necessary, a hospital bed. There had been a time when he had gone regularly to the meetings of the Sensimener Seminar? Sensimener. Sensimener. Sensimener Society, uh, had accepted positions in their ranks and had attended all the parties. Now, Abraham Mechles was marrying off his younger daughter, Sylvia. The minute the invitation arrived, Gretel had announced her decision. She was not going to let herself be carted off to a wedding somewhere out in the wilds of Brownsville. If, uh, if he, Solomon, wanted to go and gorge himself on all kinds of greasy food, coming home at three o'clock in the morning, that was his prerogative. Okay, so let's just uh, make sure that we're all um, aware of what this background is that we that we have set up. So, so this doctor, he's a medical doctor, but he's also very well educated and very well connected in the community. And the, uh, the just to make sure that we get it clear, a lanceman, everybody knows that what a lanceman is, I hope. A lanceman is a person from the same town back in Europe. So this was an idea that when you came to the United States, um, Jews tried to find people, not just family members, but people that they knew from the old country, from their, from their original town. So 
<coughs> a landsman is a person from the old land. And the landsmanschaften were social uh, clubs that were organized according to where you came from. So uh, once upon a time when, when, uh, when Zelda and I lived on the Lower East Side in the, in the early 70s, um, if you walk down East Broadway, every single storefront had shingles because it was either the storefront or it was upstairs um, of another Landsmannschaft. So there were all kinds of people uh, from, from all kinds of different towns. And uh, where we see this also, unfortunately, is when we go to cemeteries. Um, we have uh, cemetery uh, um, sections that have been uh, uh, purchased by synagogues and so on. But in the old days, they were purchased also by these Landsmannschaften, by these social club uh, uh, organizations, so that everybody would be buried together. So what's happening here is that this Dr. Margolin, he had gone regularly to meetings of the St. Simoner Society because he came from St. Simon, right? You got it, St. Simon, St. Simon, but the, the Jews pronounce it St. Simon. Um, and uh, just like Satmar is actually Satomar, it's St. Mary. Um, so these are you know, towns in Europe that the Jews came from. So he was part of that Landsmannschaft. And now there's a wedding happening among the social uh, group from that Landsmannschaft. And he feels that he has to go and Gretel, his wife, doesn't want to go. Okay. Dr. Margolin admitted to himself that his wife was right. When would he get a chance to sleep? He, he had to be at the hospital early Monday morning. Moreover, moreover, he was on a strict fat-free diet. A wedding like this one would be a feast of poisons. Everything about such celebrations irritated him now. The anglicized Yiddish, the Yiddishized English, the ear-splitting music and the unruly dances. Jewish laws and customs were completely distorted. Men who had no regard for Jewishness wore skullcaps and the reverend rabbis and cantors aped the Christian ministers. Whenever he took Gretel to a wedding or bar mitzvah, he was ashamed. Even she, born a Christian, could see that American Judaism was a mess. At least this time, he would be spared the trouble of making apologies to her. Usually, after breakfast on Sunday, he and his wife took a walk in Central Park, or, when the weather was mild, went to the Palisades. But today, Solomon Margolin lingered in bed. During the years, he had stopped attending the functions of the Sensiminer Society. Meanwhile, the town of saint Simon had been destroyed. His family there had been tortured, burned, gassed. Many saint Simoners had survived and later come to America from the camps, but most of them were younger people with whom he, with whom he Solomon, had not known in the old country. Tonight, everyone would be there, the saint Simoners belonging to the bride's family and the Terish Polars belonging to the grooms. He knew how they would pester him, reproach him, <coughs> for growing aloof, drop hints that he was a snob. They would address him familiarly, familiarly, familiarly uh, slap him on the back, drag him off to dance. Well, even so, he had to go to Sylvia's wedding. He had already sent out a present. The day had dawned gray and dreary as dusk. Overnight, a heavy snow had fallen. Solomon Margolin had hoped to make up for the sleep he was going to lose, but unfortunately he had waked even earlier than usual. Finally, he got up. He shaved himself meticulously at the bathroom mirror and also trimmed the gray hair at his temples. The day of all days, he looked his age. There were bags under his eyes and his face was lined. Exhaustion showed in his features. His nose, his nose appeared longer and sharper than usual. There were sec. deep folds at the sides of his mouth. Okay. After breakfast, he stretched out on the living room sofa. From there, he could see Gretel, who was standing in the kitchen, ironing. Blonde, faded, middle-aged, she had on a skimpy petticoat and her calves were as muscular as a dancer's. Gretel had been a nurse in the Berlin hospital where he had been a member of the staff. Of her family, one brother, a Nazi, had died uh, of typhus in a Russian prison camp. A second, who was a communist, had been shot by the Nazis. Her aged father vegetated at home of his, uh, and at the home of his, 
vegetated at the home of his other daughter in Hamburg, and Gretel sent him money regularly. She herself had become almost Jewish in New York. She had made friends with Jewish women, joined Hadassah, learned to cook Jewish dishes, even her sigh was Jewish, and she, met, she lamented continually over the Nazi catastrophe. She had her plot waiting for her beside his in that part of the seminary, a cemetery that the Sensiminers had reserved for themselves. Dr. Margolin yawned, reached for a cigarette that lay on an ashtray on the ta coffee table beside him, and began to think about himself. His career had gone well. Ostensibly, he was, an, he was a success. He had an office on Weston Avenue and wealthy patients. His colleagues respected him, and he was an important figure in Jewish circles in New York. What more could a boy from St. Simon expect? A self-taught man, the son of a poor teacher of Talmud. In, per, in person, he was tall, quite handsome, and he had always had a way with women. He still pursued them more than was good for him at his age and with his high blood pressure. But secretly, Solomon Margolin had always felt that he was a failure. As a child, he'd been acclaimed as a prodigy, reciting, reciting long passages of the Bible and studying the Talmud and the commentaries on his own. When he was a boy of 11, he had sent for a reposium, a, responsum. A, a responsum. He had sent for a responsum to the rabbi of Tarnow. Right, who, a responsum is a tshuva, right. Right, a, a religious re, a response answer to a question. So already he was already sending questions to great rabbis. I refer, I refer to him in his reply as great and illustrious. In his teens, he had become a master of the guide to the, of the perplexed and the kuzari. He had taught himself algebra and geometry, geometry. At 17, he attempted a translation of Spinoza's ethics from Latin into Hebrew, unaware that it had been done before. Everyone predicted he would turn out to be a genius, but he had squandered his talents, continually changing his field of study, and he had wasted years in learning languages and wandering from country to country. Nor had he had any luck with his one great love, Razel, the daughter of the Melech, of Melech, Melech the watchmaker. The watchmaker. Razel had married someone else and later had been shot by the Nazis. All his life, Solomon Margolin had been plagued by the eternal questions. He still lay awake at night trying to solve the mysteries of the universe. He suffered from hypochondria and a fear of death haunted even his dreams. Hitler's carnage and the extinction of his family had rooted out the last hope for better days, had destroyed all his faith in humanity. He had begun to despise the matrons who came to him with their petty ills, while millions were devising horrible deaths for one another. Gretel came in from the kitchen. What shirt are you going to put on? Solomon Margolin regarded her quietly. She had had her own share of troubles. She had suffered in silence for her two brothers, even for Hans, the Nazi. She had gone through a prolonged change of life. She was tortured by guilt feelings, guilt feelings towards him, Solomon. She had become sexually frigid. Now her face was flushed and covered with beads of sweat. He earned more than enough to pay for a maid, yet Gretel insisted on doing all the housework herself, even the laundry. It, be, it had become a mania with her. Every day she scoured the oven. She was forever polishing the windows of their apartment on the 16th floor and without using a safety belt. All the other housewives in the building ordered their groceries delivered, but Gretel lugged the heavy bags from the supermarket herself. At night, she sometimes said things that sounded slightly insane to him. St she still suspected him of carrying on with every female patient he treated. Now, husband and wife sized each other up wryly, feeling the strangeness that comes, from great, comes of great familiarity. He was always amazed at how she had, had lost her looks. No one feature had altered, but something in her aspect had given way. Her pride, her hopefulness, her curiosity. He blurted out, what shirt? It doesn't matter, a white shirt. <clears throat> You're not going to wear the tuxedo? Wait, I'll bring you a vitamin. I don't want a vitamin. But you yourself said they're good for you. Leave me alone. Well, it's your health, not mine. And slowly she walked out of the room, hesitating as if she expected him to remember something and call her back. Yeah. Dr. Solomon Margolin took a last look in the mirror and left the house. He felt refreshed by the half hour nap he had, he had had after dinner. Despite his age, he still wanted to impress people with his appearance. 
even the sensimeters. He had illusion, he had his illusions. In Germany, he had taken pride in the fact that he looked like a Junker. And in New York, he was often aware that he could pass for an Anglo-Saxon. <clears throat> he was tall, slim, blonde, blue-eyed. His hair was thinning, had turned somewhat gray, but he managed to disguise these signs of age. He stooped a little, but in company was quick to straighten up. Years ago in Germany, he had worn a monocle. And though in New York that would have been too pretentious, his glance still retained a European severity. He had his principles. He had never broken his Hippocratic oath. With his patience, he was honorable to an extreme, avoiding every kind of cunt. And he had refused a number of dubious associations that smacked of careerism. Gretel claimed his sense of honor amounted to a mania. Dr. Margolin's car was in the garage was in the garage, not a Cadillac like most of his colleagues, but he decided to go by taxi. He was unfamiliar with Brooklyn and the heavy snow made driving hazardous. He waved his hand and at once a taxi pulled over to the curb. He was afraid the driver might refuse to go as far as Brownsville, but he flicked the meter on without a word. Dr. Margolin peered through the frosted window into the wintry Sunday night, but there was nothing to be seen. The New York streets were sp uh, streets sprawled out, wet, dirty, impenetrably dark. After a while, Dr. Margolin leaned back, shut his eyes, and retreated into his, his own warmth. His destination was a wedding. Wasn't the world like this taxi plunging away somewhere into the unknown toward a cosmic destination? Maybe a cosmic Brownsville, a cosmic wedding. Yes, but why did God, or whatever anyone wanted to call him, create a Hitler, a Stalin, why did he need his world wars? Why heart attacks, cancer? Dr. Margolin took out a cigarette and lit it mechanically. What had, what had they been thinking of, those pious uncles <coughs> of his <coughs> when they were digging their own graves? Was, immort was immortality possible? Was there such a thing as the soul? All the arguments for and against weren't worth a pinch of dust. The taxi turned into the bridge across the East River and for the first time, Dr. Margolin was able to see the sky. It sagged low, heavy, red as glowing metal. Excuse me one second. Just wanna make sure I'm not disturbing Adrian up there. The taxi turned into, uh, onto the bridge across the East River and for the first time, Dr. Margolin was able to see the sky. It sagged low, heavy, red as glowing metal. Higher up, a violet glare suffused the vault of the heavens. Snow was sifting down gently, bringing a winter peace to the world, just as it had in the past 40 years ago, a thousand years ago, and perhaps a million years ago. Fiery pillars appeared to glow beneath the East River on its surface. Through black waves jagged as rocks, a tugboat was hauling a string of barges loaded with cars. A front window in the cab was open and icy gusts of wind blew in, smelling of gasoline and the sea. Suppose the weather never changed again. Who then would ever be able to imagine a summer day, a moonlit night, spring? But how much imagination for what it's worth does a man actually have? On Eastern Parkway, the taxi was jolted and screeched suddenly to a stop. Some traffic accident, apparently. The siren on a police car shrieked. A wailing ambulance drew nearer. Dr. Margolin closed his eyes. Another victim. Someone makes a false turn of the wheel and all a man's plans in this world are reduced to nothing. Sometime later, the taxi started moving again. Solomon Margolin was now driving through streets he had never seen before. It was New York, but it might as well have just, been, might, might just as well have been Chicago or Cleveland. They passed through an industrial district with factory buildings, warehouses of coal, lumber, scrap iron. Negroes strangely black stood about the sidewalks, staring ahead, their great dark eyes full of gloomy hopelessness. Occasionally the car would pass a tavern. The people at the bar seemed to have something unearthly about them, unearthly about them, as if they were being punished here for sins committed in another incarnation. Just when Solomon Margolin was beginning to suspect that the driver who had remained stubbornly silent the whole time had gotten lost or else, was, or else was deliberately taking him out of his way, 
the taxi entered a thickly populated neighborhood. They passed a synagogue, a funeral parlor, and there ahead was the wedding hall, all lit up with its neon Jewish sign and Star of David. Dr. Margolin gave the driver a dollar tip and the man took it without uttering a word. <clears throat> Dr. Margolin entered the outer, outer lobby <clears throat> and immediately the comf comfortable in intimacy of the centimeters engulfed him. All the faces <clears throat> he saw were familiar, though he didn't recognize individuals. Leaving his hat and his coat at the check room, he put on a skull cap and entered the hall. It was filled with people and music, with tables heaped with food, a bar stacked with bottles. The musicians were playing an Israeli march that was a hodgepodge of American jazz with Oriental flourishes. Men were dancing with men, women with women, men with women. He saw black skull caps, white skull caps, bare heads. Guests kept arriving, pushing their way through the crowd, some still in their hats and coats, munching hors d'oeuvres, drinking schnapps. The house, the hall resounded with stamping, screaming, laughing, clapping. Flash bulbs went off blindingly as the photographers made their rounds. Seeming to come from nowhere, the bride appeared, briskly sweeping up her train, followed by a retinue of bridesmaids. Dr. Margolin knew everybody, and yet nobody. People spoke to him, laughed, winked, and waved, and he answered each one with a smile, a nod, a bow. Gradually, he threw off all his worries, all his desperation. Depression. He became a depression. All depression. <clears throat> he became half drunk on the amalgam of odors, flowers, sauerkraut, garlic, perfume, mustard, and that nameless odor that only centimeters emit. Hello, doctor. Hello, doctor. Uh, hello, Shlome Dovid. Shlome Dovid. You don't recognize me, eh? Look, he forgot. There were encounters, there were the encounters, the regrets, the reminiscences of long ago. But after all, we were, weren't we neighbors? You used to come to our house to borrow the Yiddish newspaper. Someone had already kissed him and a badly shaven snout, a mouth reeking of whiskey and rotten teeth. One woman was so convulsed with laughter that she lost an earring. Margolin tried to pick it up, but it had already been trampled underfoot. You don't recognize me, eh? Take a good look. It's Zissel, the son of Chaya, Chaya Bele. Why don't you eat something? Why don't you have something to drink? Come over here, take a glass. What do you want? Whiskey, brandy, cognac, scotch with soda, with Coca-Cola? Take some, it's good, don't let it stand. So long as you're here, you might as well enjoy yourself. My father, he was killed. They were all killed. I'm the only one left of the entire family. Barish, the son of Fivish, starved to death in Russia. They sent him to, the, to Kazakhstan. His wife in Israel, she married a Lithuanian. Sor Sorele? Sorella. Sorella. Sor Keep doing Italian. Sorella, shot together with her children. Yentel, here at the wedding. She was standing here just a moment ago. There she is, dancing with that tall fellow. Abraham Zilberstein? They burned him in the synagogue with 20 others. A mound of charcoal was all that was left, coal and ash. Yosele Budnik, he passed away years ago. You must mean <coughs> uh, Yekele. Yekele, Yekele Budnik. He, was, he has a delicatessen store right here in Brownsville. Married a widow whose husband made a fortune in real estate. Lechayim, doctor, Lechayim. Shloimi uh, Dovid? Shloimi Dovid. Shloimi Dovid. Shloimi Dovid. It doesn't offend you that I call you Shlomo Dovid? To me, you're still the same Shlomo Dovid, the little boy with the blonde side curls who recited a whole tractate of the Talmud by heart. You remember, don't you? It seems like only yesterday, your father, may he rest in peace, was beaming with pride. Your brother Chaim, your uncle Oiz Ozer? Oiza. They killed, Oiza. They killed everyone, everyone. They took, they took a whole people and wiped them out with German efficiency. The Leich Gishalat, Leich. I don't know it. Right. Smoothly just <clears throat> done. Have you seen the bride yet? Pretty as a picture, but too much makeup. Imagine a grandchild of Reb to uh, Todros of Radzin, and her grandfather used to wear two skull caps, one in the front and one in the back. Do you see that young woman dancing in the yellow dress? It, it's Riva's sister. Their father was Moisha the candle maker. Riva herself? Where all the others ended up. Auschwitz. 
how close we came ourselves. All, uh, all of us are really dead, if you want to call it that. We were exterminated, wiped out. Even the survivors carried death in their hearts. But it's a wedding. We should be cheerful. L'chaim, Shlomo Dovid. I would like to congratulate you. Have you a son or daughter to marry off? No? Well, it's better that way. What's the sense of having children if people are such murderers? There's already time for the ceremony, but someone still had not come. Whether it was the rabbi, the cantor, one of the in-laws who was missing, nobody seemed able to find out. Abraham Melech, uh, Mechlech, Mechlech. Mechlech, the bride's father, rushed around, scowled, waved his hand, whispered in people's ears. He looked strange in his rented tuxedo. The Tarish pole mother-in-law was wrangling with one of the phot photographers. The musicians never stopped playing for an instant. The drum banged, the, ba uh, banged, the, bass, the bass fiddle uh, growled, the saxophone blared. The dances became faster, more abandoned, and more and more people were drawn in. The young men stamped with such force that it seemed the dance floor would break under them. Small boys romped around like goats, and little girls whirled about wildly together. Many of the men were already drunk. They shouted boasts, howled with laughter, kissed strange women. There was so much commotion that Solomon Margolin could no longer grasp what was being said to him and simply nodded yes to everything. Some of the guests had attached themselves to him, wouldn't move and kept <clears throat> pulling him in all directions, introducing him to more and more people from St. Simon and Tereshpol. A matron with a nose covered with warts pointed a finger at him, wiped her eyes, called him Shlomile. Solomon Margolin inquired who she was and somebody told him. Names were swallowed up in the tumult. He heard the same words over and over again, died, shot, burned. A man from Tereshbol tried to draw him aside and was shouted down by several Sinsiminers, calling him an intruder who had no business there. A latecomer arrived, a horse and a buggy driver from Sinsimin who had become a multimillionaire, a million, become a millionaire in New York. Not multi, just Not a millionaire, yeah, just a millionaire. Not yet. <clears throat> His wife and children had perished, but already he had a new wife. The woman weighed with diamonds, paraded about in a low-cut gown and bared a back, covered with blotches to the waist. Her voice was husky. Where did she come from? Who was she? Certainly no saint. Her first husband was a swindler who amassed a fortune and then dropped dead. Of what? Cancer? Where? In the stomach. First, you don't have anything to eat, and then you don't have anything to eat it with. A man was... A man is always working for a second husband. <clears throat> I don't understand that. A man is always working for the second husband. Right. In other words, you work, you earn all the money, then you die, <clears throat> and all the money oh, goes to the second husband. The husband. <clears throat> a man is always working for the second husband. What is life anyway? A dance on the grave. Yes, but as long as you're playing the game, you have to abide by the rules. Dr. Margolin, why aren't you dancing? You're not, a, you're not among strangers. We're all from the same dust. Over there, you weren't a doctor. You were only Shlomi Dovid, Shlomi Dovid, the son of the Talmud teacher. Before you know it, we'll be lying side by side. Margolin didn't recall drinking anything, but he felt intoxicated all the same. The foggy hall was spinning like a carousel. The floor was rocking. Standing in a corner, he contem contemplated the dance. What different expression the dancers wore how many combinations and permutations of being the creator had brought together here, the creator had brought together here. Every face told its own story. They were dancing together, these people, but each one had his own philosophy, his own approach. A man grabbed Margolin and for a while he danced in a frantic whirl. Then tearing himself loose, he stood apart. Who was that woman? He found his eye caught by her familiar form. He knew her. She beckoned to him. He stood baffled. She looked neither young nor old. Where had he known her? That narrow face, those dark eyes, a girlish smile. Sorry, the phone's going to ring. Can't really stop it. Hey, can you throw it against the wall? I could hang up, but that would be okay. nice. I just have to wait it out. It, can, it uh, distracts me. I can't. Uh... Wait. Yeah. Uh, a man grabbed Margolin and for a while he danced in a frantic whirl. Then tearing himself loose, loose he stood apart. I went back. Who was that woman? 
He found his eye caught by her familiar form. He knew her, she beckoned to him. He stood baffled. She looked neither young nor old. Where had he known her, that narrow face, those dark eyes, that girlish smile? Her hair was arranged in the old manner with long braids wound like a wreath around her head. The grace of some simon adorned her, something he, Margolin, had long since forgotten. And those eyes, he was in love with those eyes and, and had been all his life. He half smiled at her and the woman smiled back. There were dimples in her cheeks. She too appeared surprised. Margolin thought he realized Though, he had begun, though, though he realized. Oh, Margolin, though he realized he had begun to blush like a boy, went up to her. I know you, but you're not from, but you're not from St. Simon. Yes, from St. Simon. He had heard that voice long ago. He had been in love with that voice. From St. Simon, who are you then? Her lips trembled. You've forgotten me already? <clears throat> it's, a, it's a long time since I left St. Simon. You used to visit my father. Who was your father? Melech, the watchmaker. Dr. Margolin shivered. If I'm not does out of my mind. Does everybody remember Melech the watchmaker? <clears throat> does everybody remember who his daughter was? Rizal. Right. <clears throat> Rizal was his daughter. Go ahead. Melech the watchmaker, Dr. Margolin shivered. If I'm not out of my mind, then I'm seeing things. Why do you say that? Because Rizal, Rizal or Rizal? Rizal, Rizal. Razel is dead. I'm Razel. You're Razel. Here. Oh my God, if that's true, then anything is possible. Where did, when did you come to New York? Some time ago. From where? From over there. But everybody told me that you were dead. My father, my mother, my brother Herschel, that you were married. I was. If that's true, then anything, were possible, anything is possible, repeated Dr. Margolin, still shaken by the incredible happening. Someone must have purposely deceived him, but why? He was aware that there was a mistake somewhere, but could not determine where. <clears throat> why didn't you let me know? After all, he fell silent. She too was silent for a moment. I lost everything, but I still had some pride left. Come with me somewhere quieter, anywhere. This is, happy. This is the happiest day of my life. But it's night, then the happiest night, almost as if the Messiah had come, as if the dead had come to life. Where do you want to go? All right, let's go. Margolin took her arm and felt at once the thrill long forgotten of youthful desire. He steered her away from the other guests, afraid that he might lose her in the crowd or that someone would break in and spoil his happiness. Everything had returned in an instant, the embarrassment, the agitation, the joy. He wanted to take her away to hide somewhere alone with her. Leaving the reception hall, they went upstairs to the chapel where the wedding ceremony was to take place. The door was standing open. Inside on a raised platform stood the permanent wedding canopy. A bottle of wine and a silver goblet were placed in readiness for the ceremony. The chapel with its empty pews and only one glimmering light was full of shadows. The music, so blaring below, sounded soft and distant up here. Both of them hesitated at the threshold. Margolin pointed to the wedding canopy. We could have stood there. Yes. Tell me about yourself. Where are you now? What are you doing? It's not easy to tell. Are you alone? Are you attached? Attached? No. Would you never have let me hear from you? He asked. She didn't answer. Gazing at her, he knew his love had returned with full force. Already he was trembling at the thought that they might soon have to part. The excitement, the expectancy of youth filled him. He wanted to take her in his arms and kiss her, but at any moment, someone might come in. He stood beside her, ashamed that he had married someone else, that he had not personally confirmed the reports of her death. How could I have sus suppressed all this love? How could I have accepted the world without her? And what will happen now with Gretel? I give her everything, I gi I'll give her everything, my last cent. He looked round toward the stairway to see if any of the guests had started to come up. The thought had come to him that by Jewish law, he was not married for he and Gretel had only had only a civil ceremony. He looked at, at Reisel. 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 According to Jewish law, I'm a single man. Is that so? According to Jewish law, I could lead you up there and marry you. She seemed to be considering the import of his words. <clears throat> yes, I realize. According to Jewish law, I don't even need a ring. One can get married with a penny. 
you have a penny. He put his hand in his breast pocket, but his wallet was gone. He started searching in his other pockets. Have I been robbed, he wondered, but how? I was sitting in the taxi the whole time. Could someone have robbed me here at the wedding? He was not so much disturbed as surprised. He said falteringly, strange, but I don't have any money. We'll get along without it. But how am I going to get home? Why go home, she said, countering the with a question. She smiled that, with that familiar smile of hers that was so full of mystery. He took her by the wrist and gazed at her. Suddenly it occurred to him that this could not be his Rachel. She was too young. Probably it was her daughter who was playing along, playing along with him, mocking him. For God's sakes, I'm completely confused, he thought. He stood bewildered, trying to untangle the years. He couldn't tell, for, tell her age from her features. Her eyes were deep, dark, and melancholy. She also appeared confused, as if she too sensed more, said some discrepancy. The whole thing is a mistake, Markland told himself. But where exactly was the mistake? And what had happened to the wallet? Could he have left it in the taxi after paying the driver? He tried to remember how much cash he had in it, but was unable to. I must have had too much to drink. These people have made me drunk, dead drunk. For a long time, he stood silent, lost in some dreamless state, more profound than a narcotic trance. Suddenly he remembered the traffic collision he had witnessed on Eastern Parkway. An eerie suspicion came over him. Perhaps it had been more than a witness. Perhaps he had been more than a witness. Perhaps he himself had been the victim of the accident. He began to examine himself as though he were one of his own patients. He could find no trace of pulse or breathing. And he felt oddly deflated as, as if some physical dimension were missing. The sensation of weight, the muscular tension of his limbs, the hidden aches in his bones, all seemed to be gone. It can't be, it can't be, he murmured. Can one die without knowing it? And what will Gretel do? He blurted out. You're not the same, uh, re uh, Reisel. Reisel. No, Reisel. I can't get it right. Uh, you're Gertrude not the same. Gertrude Stein. She said it. Okay. A Reisel is a Reisel is a Reisel. Okay. You're not the same Reisel. No, then who am I? Unless we're both dead. <clears throat> what do you mean? They shot Reisel. Shot her? Who told you that? She seemed both frightened and confused. Silently, she lowered her head like someone receiving the shock of bad news. Dr. Margolin continued to ponder. Apparently, Razel didn't realize her own condition. He had heard of such a stage. What is it called? Hovering in the world of twilight. But death couldn't be that simple. This kind of survival would be less than oblivion. He leaned over and whispered in her ear, what's the difference as long as we're together? I've been waiting. I've been waiting for that all these years. Where have you been? She didn't answer, he didn't ask again. He looked around, the empty hall was full, all the seats taken. The ceremonious hush fell over the audience. The music played softly. The cantor intoned the benedictions. With measured steps, Abraham Meckless led his daughter down the aisle. All right. What does anybody say? He's dead. Why didn't he just say that and, and save us, you know, five pages of a story? Right? Well, because it's a great story. Uh, Carol. Uh, I, I, I believe two, two things uh, struck me. One, he, he, he was probably the victim of the accident and this is his twilight, this dreaming. And one of the things that hit me and I'm sure you'll understand where I'm coming from, Rabbi, that when they talked about, uh, shoot. I, I'm sorry, I've got to take it, it's the chapel. All right. I'll be back. Good, so you put yourself on mute, thank you. Josie. Uh, yes, I'm rereading Hello? one of my favorite books by him, Shadows on the Hudson. And Dr. Margolin is a character in the book. Uh -huh. Look at that, that, look at that. Word for word, the monocle, the fact that he was tall. And it also reminds me of another of Singer's stories, Enemies, a love story, where people show up after the Holocaust who everybody else thought were dead. I love Isaac Singer's stories. Um, I think it's a bit of a, a longing and a dream kind of mixed together. 
What longing for what? For the for the woman he loved, for the past where he had all these ideals and he was considered a child genius. And and life life was simple in those shtetls and towns. I, I think part of him would have been happier there had the world not crashed around them. It's so typical of Singer to mix all these things together. Right. Yeah, he might not have died. He might he might be still sleeping on the sofa dreaming <laughs> after dinner. Well, those you know, it's like Chekhov said. You know, those things are indicative of like why do we have to know he was sleeping on the sofa? It doesn't propel the story unless there's some reason. Yeah. Um... Anybody else? Anybody else want to chime in here? Come on, Meryl. Yeah. So I can't really talk right now, but this story touched me right from the beginning before I knew he was dead. There's something about this that's just very touching. I can't explain it. It has, must have something to do with, you know, something that's going on with myself, but. Um, I just found it very touching and, you know, I'm sort of weepy right now. And um, I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but I, it, it was just a, a, the whole story, even the ending. That, the ending was sort of like a Twilight Zone kind of an ending. Mm. But, but even without that, um, I, I just found the whole thing just so um, moving and disturbing. And, you know, I, I, I can't explain why but i'm just expressing how i'm feeling right now like which pieces do you remember a particular piece that hit you you know what, what elements what details um well starting from the beginning you know he sort of went in a totally different direction uh, when he got married um and left all of that um past behind i found that very sad um, the fact that um, now at, at the wedding, you know, constantly feeling detached from everybody and, and everything, just kind of like going through the situation almost like a zombie. Um, I just, just kind of felt touched and um, sad about that. I guess that's what it is. You know, they might all be dead. Wait, wait, wait. Carol, Carol, go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, Rabbi, it was, not, it was not business. She just needed information. So there's, it wasn't anything I had to do. Um, but as, as I was saying, I, based on the story, I had the feeling that he died in the, ex, in, in, the uh, uh, in the taxi and he was, he was like dreaming. And the reason he thought Razel wasn't Razel or could have been her daughter because he was remembering her when he saw her last. And I think you remember people when you see them last. But one of the things that struck me in the beginning was talking about Gretel not being, being Christian, he being Jewish, and, and how the society bought property and the two of them were gonna end up together. And that made no sense to me because you can't do interfaith burials unless he was taking a poetic license. Or unless the society didn't know that she didn't convert. That's a possibility. But you don't know, you don't know. True. Yeah, John. Uh, I was going, I found it online. I was kind of going back and looking at the beginning again. Just, I wonder if the, it's a whole, like everybody's dead. Like, has he, there's, he says he doesn't quite recognize the people, but the faces look familiar. So I wanted to compare the names of, or do, 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 are we told which, whose wedding it is? Anyway, I think it's, um, I think all those ambiguities are what's great. Yeah. I mean, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of people are dead in this story, right? I mean, it's-, it's All they're the talking wedding. about. That's all they're talking about. It's a wedding in Brownsville. And then as people are catching up, just the catalog of death is endless. Oh, this one died here. This one over there. This one, their whole family. What do you expect? This one, this. Um, there's a kind of a question about whether there is anything beyond death. Not just, you know, is there life? Is, 
if, is there any life after the death of the Jewish people? You know, the, the Jewish people in a certain major way died as a people. Um, their way of life, it's not so much, you know, that, that the, 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 what Josie was saying, you know, in the old country, life was simpler. Life was human and there was all kinds of things. And he had plenty of, you know, questions about how to live his life, uh, you know, when he ran away from being a, a Talmud prodigy to do all kinds of other things that was all beforehand. That was complicated enough, but it was their complicated life, you know, and then it was all like it says in the story, it was all wiped clean all wiped out. Um, and uh, Singer feels this, you know, deeply, deeply, deeply. Um, and, uh, you know, he has this wonderful, amazing, successful career in America. You know, it, it really did in a certain sense, um, you know, it, it constantly, all of, all of the, the survivors, each one survived in their own with their own struggle, with their own way. Um, but to be a success and to be a success as a Jewish voice, you know, he says early on, you know, there's no hiding it. American Jewish life is a mess, right? It's like he, you know, you can't fool him. He knows what the real deal was. You know, he, may, he may have, you know, left it a little bit or he may have done whatever he did, but, you know, this other stuff, don't, 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 don't kid me. Um, so there's this tremendous, um, obviously, you know, <clears throat> wait for the people who went through it, for the people who lost everything and lost everybody. And even if they are alive, are they really alive? You know, so is everybody, mm -hmm. everybody that counted, you know, was if, if everybody that counted was dead, then what's next? Um, you know, and that's, and yet, what's the last line of the story? The wedding line, starts. The wedding starts. And it brings up that question. Is this a wedding up in heaven of all the dead people that never got a chance to have their weddings and to have their, uh, their life continue? Is that where this wedding is taking place? Or is this really a wedding in Brownsville? And you know what? There is a certain incomprehensible miracle that happened, which is the people that didn't die lived. And the people that didn't die got married. And the people that didn't die had children and had a future. And then there was more. So uh, who could imagine that such a thing could happen? Yeah, Carol. Well, I, <laughs> excuse me, I think, I think the wedding was real. And I think he, the doctor was on his way to the wedding when this accident happened. And I think he was in the, what you call the twilight zone. Mm -hmm. But, but I get the impression, I get the feeling that he, um, that this took place within several years after world, after the Holocaust. Right. And when, and when people Many met everybody. They wanted to know if anybody of their relatives. So it was a, it was a logical thing to discuss at the time. So the topic of conversation that this one didn't survive and that one didn't survive was typical of that time frame. That's right. Right. So, so it's um, it's an interest it's an interesting concept. But uh, one of the things uh, that I was thinking. <clears throat> It was an interesting concept, but one of the things that struck me is when they was talking about marrying Razel, when the doctor was talking about marrying Razel, it struck me of another story we had told where the man had married, had a wife, but then he married somebody else and then went back to visit, to, went back to visit and, 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 and refused and to come back. The land of the demons. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting how with all the stories you pick, there is a wave of similarity running through them. And I don't know if you if that's planned or just happens. Who knows? Who knows? Um, any other comments to, that people want to want to? Yeah, Merle, go ahead. Um, so you know how people say people who've had these near death experiences, they they talk about 
um, they, they, they jumble, you know, the past. They see people that they loved and, and knew and who were dead. And then they're, they're sort of in the present. They're, they're seeing the nurses and the doctors uh, hovering over them. And it's all a jumble in that. Uh, and if that's so, he's having that kind of an experience where he, he was uh, half dead after that accident. And he's jumbling everything together. He's on the way to a wedding. He's seeing, you know, Razel from his past. Um, and and uh, I sort of see that as maybe what, what was going on with him uh, as he was dying. What do people make of, of his present situation with Gretel? I think it would maybe a marriage of convenience or they just got married. They cared for each other originally, but now they just exist together because they're married. And as, it, as pointed out towards the end, he, did, he said he wasn't married. In, in, the Jew, in Judaism, he wasn't married by Jewish law because they went to a civil, cer civil cer uh, ceremony. So he could marry her and I think he was trying to do it. But I, I think in the long run, it could be just, you know, they got used to each other and that was it. Yeah, time wasn't kind to them. Right, uh, whatever passion, whatever uh, vitality there was, whatever drew them together at one point, um, by now there is a, you know, a, a, a kind of a, they're connected. You know, she wants to make sure that he looks okay, but she's not going to the wedding, but she wants to make sure he's okay. She wants to give him a vitamin, but you know, it's your health, not mine. I'm not gonna fight with you. You know, he looks at her and he goes, where, where is the time gone? Where is the beauty gone? Where's everything gone? I'm, I'm gonna try with your permission for a second. I'm going to try to um, bring up, um, let's see if this works. Um, okay, here I am. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up, Basheva Singer was the son of a Hasidic rabbi. He wrote a book in my father's court. Um, his elder brother was also a very accomplished uh, uh, writer, a novelist, journalist. Um, and uh, he considered himself, you know, a, an atheist or an agnostic, like, like, you know, people that are mentioned in the story. And yet uh, recently this prayer that he wrote, um, Beryl, take care. Um, Hi, Beryl. Was was discovered and translated. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share the screen again. Can you see that? Can you everybody see this? Yeah. Okay. So he wrote this prayer. This is the prayer, and uh, Isaac Singer. It's it's on an invoice that he got from this uh, uh, company, um, and. Uh, um, it was on a receipt that uh, from a rent receipt from the apartment that he lived in, right? Where he paid on the Upper West Side, $73.50. Those, those were the days of affordable housing. Um, anyway, so I thought uh, we might look at this prayer for a second. Um, here it is. John, you got it? You see it? Isaac Besheva Singer, Master of the Universe, fill my heart with love for my people and rest for the soul. Let me see the Creator in each and every creature, its mercy for everything, for each thing it creates. There's not a single drop of water, water or particle of dust in which your light is lacking or that is outside your domain. There is no creature without its Creator. Those who know this live always in joy. Their parents, their parents are but bodies that are here today and are tomorrow in their graves. All their friends, all their possessions and honors are like a passing shadow. They are themselves like passing clouds, like Jonah's tree. But you, you have always existed and will always exist. You are the only true being, the essence of all things. Only for you are all problems solved, all challenge, cha challenges effortless. There's nothing devious in you, no, no retribution, injustice, or fault. Evil lives in all things temporary, not in what exists eternally. 
You know why you created evil and who are we to question your integrity? <clears throat> we have only one comfort in this world, that you are a maker and that we have the power to serve you with joy, awe and love all our lives. And that you have given us the ability to understand such things. Though we may not know the purpose of life or why you sent us into this world to suffer, we understand that it is our duty to build and not to destroy, to comfort and not to torment, to bring joy rather than sorrow to your creatures. There is only one joy, to increase and not lessen the world's joy. Seek happiness, but not on account of your neighbors or family, for you are they and they are you. You are bonded, children of God. God, guard my tongue from evil, my lips from deceit, my mind from sin. Open my heart to your commands. Let my heart seek your teaching and let all my actions serve a higher purpose. Those who fear God are the only ones who do not hurt each other, neither in fact nor in principle. They will never wage war against each other. And for this reason, they are a symbol of peace as it is written, and your children's peace shall grow. Uh if all of us agnostics and-, and uh, Why isn't that in the Siddur? Yeah, well, because they just got it. Um, but believe me, it could be in another edition, in, in a new edition. It's um, a beautiful, every, it's beautiful. Every agnostic and, athe and atheist could pray like that, then uh, why can't we pray like that, right? So uh, wouldn't be so bad. It's beautiful and it's, I, I, feel, I felt it was like modern. Okay, and yet, it, it really is based on traditional phrases that are linked together and sewn together, uh, you know, one phrase after another, hearkening from, from you know, different, different parts of our tradition. Um, yeah. So with those sentiments, let's uh, call it a day. And uh, I'll see you hopefully another time. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yashikawa. Yashikawa. Bye, everybody. Thank you.